privilege to be here. I, I have to say the last uh, two days have been sort of a whirlwind, reminds me of uh, Health 2.0, where when you go, you, uh, you learn a lot and you don't know whether to be uh, excited or depressed. Uh, because you see all these wonderful people doing this wonderful work and you can't quite imagine it ever coming together and actually uh, affecting uh, patients and the communities that we live in. So it, it's, it's really exciting. Um, so what Michael wanted me to talk about, I'm barely going to talk about it all, so I'll get it done at the first so that at least I've uh, uh, satisfied Michael. Um, there's an innovation, uh, there's a, an idea that actually Michael and I sort of... Uh, wouldn't say cooked up together, but sort of refined. And that is that uh, you can't really, um, uh, you can't really pull just bits and pieces together and suddenly have healthcare be better. You actually have to create an ecosystem in which you can actually do innovation where all many of these pieces and parts that we've been talking about could actually come together and be applied in a programmatic, systematic way so that they affected whole communities. At least that's the belief. And, and since then, Peace Health has uh, seen fit to uh, create the Center for Innovation or, or actually give me the mandate to create the Center for Innovation uh, for all of Peace Health across three, uh, three states. So that's pretty interesting. But I, I, when he asked me to come and talk to a conference, it was predominantly about behavior change. It was exciting, but also I'm going, why me? I tried to talk him out of it on at least three occasions. Uh, my friends who have PhDs are all pretty quick to tell me they're real doctors, and I'm not, and there are a whole lot of real doctors here. And um, so um, I'll just give you my views from the front line. You will see question marks throughout the entire thing. I, 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 I say in the very beginning, questions and speculations, uh, because I don't know. Um, there's a lot more questions than there are answers in, in my mind for the things we're going to talk about. See if I can figure out how to make this work. Okay. So um, again, what am I going to speculate about? Um, uh, I want to think a little bit about the need to disrupt our minds before we start innovating. We talk about disruptive innovations, but I think the disruption, at least for those of us that are doctors and run healthcare systems, we really need to like whack our minds around a little bit and get it straight so we might do something interesting. And then I want to focus on what I think is, is a key piece, and that is the whole communities as health ecosystems. Talk a little bit about networks. Uh, I think flourishing, whether you, uh, uh, human flourishing uh, and the science behind it, positive psychology has is, is got to be the key to how we change things unless we can somehow trick people into continuing to pay us for visits. But if we've got to get paid for results, we've actually got to figure out how ourselves, the workers, and the patients and their families can uh, actually um, get in a psychological state uh, of flourishing so they can take on difficult problems. And then uh, briefly, if we have time at the end, and we may well not uh, talk about supporting technologies, but if you've passed by the shared care plan and stuff in the back, that's, that's some of the stuff we've been developing for about uh, eight years. Um, so why the growing interest in behavior change? Because I think it is growing. And my, the cynical or pragmatic part of me uh, sort of says, yeah, because they're at least threatening to start paying us for outcomes instead of visits. Uh, and when you've got a, when you contemplate getting paid for population health, that's behavior change. That's not I operated on your heart or I got you to come to the office. It really will be things that only occur uh, through uh, behavior change. Um, this is a slide that I promised myself about eight years ago I would put in every slide deck. Uh, I haven't failed. Uh, I think these two questions are really critical. They're very seldom asked, and they're almost always answered. They're answered before the conversation starts, so you know who you're protecting, who you're taking care of, and you know where your home is. Uh, but I would say ask yourself for the sake of what first, and you know who's really in this together. I see healthcare has too long been taking care of itself, and I think the problem space for anything we've been talking about in the last two days uh, has to be at least as big as the community. So uh, I think the we has to be at least my community. So I'm going to read something, uh, and this is where I may alienate a lot of the audience. I can assure you that's not my intent, uh, and hopefully my worst fear won't come true. But I'm going to read uh, a bit of the introduction um, to uh, the Careless Society, Community and Its Counterfeits by John McKnight, which was written about 20 years ago. 
Uh, and I, I shared it with a few of my friends, but I've certainly never done this before because I didn't know what the treatment was. John, um, you know, is a researcher at Northwestern University, and it's a pretty strident call uh, for caring communities. So here it is. Uh, there are studies everywhere indicating the loss of faith Americans have in their basic institutions. The most common response is a call for institutional reform. Leaders urge total quality management programs, new technologies, right sizing, lifelong learning, new highways for information that will renew the services provided by our systems. This book outlines the reason that these reforms will fail, and it points toward the path that will allow us to create an effective, satisfying society. We point out that our problem is not in the book, they point out that the problem is not ineffective service producing institutions. In fact, our institutions are too powerful, authoritative and strong. Our problem is weak communities uh, made ever more impotent by our strong service systems. The relationships formed by consent and the relationships formed by consent and manifested as care are the center of community. It is this care that is the essence of our role as citizens, and it is the ability of citizens to care that creates strong communities and able democracies. The most significant development transforming America since World War II has been the growth of a powerful service economy and its pervasive serving institutions. The, those institutions have commodified the care of the community and called that substitution a service. As citizens have, been, have seen the professionalization of service commodity uh, invade their communities, they have grown doubtful of their common ca capacity to care, and so it is that we have become a careless society populated by impotent citizens and ineffectual communities dependent on the counterfeit of care called human services. So you might imagine why I would not have read that or presented that to many people I work with. Uh, and I think John overstates, okay? I mean, he spent his career trying to get sort of the slums of Chicago back on their feet where people like us left when there was no money, so he had a pretty cynical view. But I, I think he does make a really strong point, and this is the first time that it felt safe enough to talk about that because with the old system, the system that has to go out, uh, we benefit when the patients are impotent and dependent upon us more visits. In the future, we actually fail because we won't get results. So now that there is a, an incentive to turn this around, the question becomes how? And that's where it's just questions marks, question marks everywhere. So uh, I have a whole talk I give that's called Between. Life occurs in the large spaces, between visits, between organizations, between uh, EMRs, which organizations and technology will support people in between, I think is a big question. A person's home, where almost all the decisions and actions occur, where medications are taken or not, where diets and exercise occur or not, needs information and decision support, probably more than we need our EMRs. So you've got John's book, and you've got what a bunch of people have actually been talking about, which is quite a pleasant surprise for me, this idea of positive psychology and what can people do so that they can actually flourish and uh, play an active role in taking care of themselves. This, um, this slide is, um, I think, a very important slide because we become, I become pretty myopic, you know, if I work in a healthcare system thinking that I'm somehow affecting everything. We're such a small part of it. Behavior change and genetics just outweigh us entirely. And what do we have with social circumstances? And, and I hate to see healthcare decide that they're going to take on all of those. I have to say that's the most expensive and ineffective solution I could possibly imagine. Um, so, um, the organization I work for, um, I joined because of this mission. It's great. It actually focuses on community health. It has to do with social justice. My dad was a Methodist minister, so it works even though they're Catholic and I'm not. And then we had a vision since 1990 of seamless care across the whole community. So I live in a really unique sort of Camelot place where we actually have always intended to work together instead of compete with each other. 
Um, We've done some interesting things. Uh, we actually ran an accountable care organization under a different name. Uh, I was the medical director from 93 to 97. RWJ selected us for the pursuing perfection thing. We did that for five or six years. We did something really strange. We talked to patients, which is just really weird. We asked them for years what it was that redesigning American healthcare would look like to them. And nothing that Ed Wagner said, who's a friend of mine, nothing that Don Berwick said, who's a friend of mine, did they have any interest in. What they wanted were navigator coaches and their own medical record that they could share with anyone they wanted. That was pre-Facebook, but they were asking for Facebook for health. Um, so the, there's a book I, I think is really important. This Zuboff from Harvard wrote a book in 98 or something called The Support Economy, and her, her theory is that the next big increase in value in the world will be when all of us have concierge functions around us that are enabled by technology. And I'm reading that at the same time I'm actually listening to these patients and I'm going, I think Zuboff is saying for everyone what patients are saying for themselves. So we're, we talk about them and we tend to uh, make them ours, you know, uh, we care managers and so forth. But the bigger idea, the more correct idea is you want a perfect matching function, somebody who knows you and knows what's out there and can get you what you want. Uh, and I think in healthcare, this is the missing role. Uh, this shouldn't be doctors. This would be the people who help you pick your doctor, by the way. Um, this is a slide that uh, sort of evolved over the last few years. I used to give talks on technology and say it's not technology, it's always got to have sociology. And I put this sort of play on you know, the computer stack, if you will, the information stack together. And I will say that almost everything I've heard here uh, is you know, data, information, communication, great. But if you don't get to the top of that stack, no value has been created. Everything below is literally waste. So the real nexus and what I think most of the important conversations here today have been about how do you have conversations that lead to commitments to new behaviors? How? I mean, some people will see this and it's news to them. No one in this room is this news to you. Everyone has your own version of this. So the question is, how do we do those things? Um, sorry, that's sort of falling apart. But here's, here's kind of what I, my question marks, okay, all over this, but this is my, my best thinking at the moment. We need positive health outcomes. We know from over 200 studies that high patient activation measure, you know, measurements uh, lead to better health and lower health care costs. So how do you get that? And um, Bill Mahoney uh, and Chris's company have done some research that really says most of the patient activation measure is actually defined by Fredrickson's positivity ratio. So if you want to have great outcomes uh, and lower costs, you need patients that have a, a, a flourishing ratio, a ratio of negative, a positive to negative affect of three to one or more. So now if that's true, and it seems to be true, then you, you start focusing on what you need to do. You have to do whatever it takes you know, uh, to get those ratios up. And you might want to do it in your company as well because you'll have a more productive uh, place. So the question is, how do you do that? And you know, I, uh, question marks everywhere. I mean, Bill Mahoney's been telling me to read Fredrickson for uh, a decade. And in preparation for this talk, I actually did go read her stuff. Um, So I think you've got to have care networks. That's sort of, uh, I think, what McKnight is talking about. Uh, I'm starting to, I'm working with uh, folks on Lummi Island. Uh, it's a real community with salt water around it and then a ferry. And uh, they're starting to say, well, it's our health families, the people we actually know and care about that knit together to make a, a health neighborhood. These are the kind of ideas I think we need to add to the other ideas that have been discussed here. Um, just a word about the disruption, and probably a lot of people have, have read Clayton Christensen's book, and John is actually the guy who got him to write it, and at least had a lot to do with it. But and you can read it if you want. I think the first two uh, business models are probably not uh, correct enough to be useful. But I think he nailed it with the third disruptive business model, which is a network model, meaning uh, the kind of stuff we're talking about here. This is actually, uh, Jane showed uh, her version of this. This is the same data from the, the transitions of care. This is from Whatcom County. And all I really want to say is these are everybody who left the hospital where they went in Whatcom County. You see the big blue dot? What do you think that is? Home. Home. People go home. And then they have very little technology and very little support to, to uh, succeed with. 
why those slides really didn't work well on your computer, did they? Um, so human flourishing, it turns out, is measurable. About 10 of my friends are doing it every day and emailing each other for the last two weeks because I started reading it prior to coming to this conference. And I'll tell you, it's very interesting to know what your ratio is every day and share it with your friends. You really start going, wow, I could have fixed that. You know, One day I was a 0.4. This is not good, by the way. Uh, and, um, but my average is, is just about two, which isn't really what you should be if you're a leader. You, know, you should get it up to three, and it's not that hard to do. So the, it's, it's actionable, and I think it's, as I said before, the core to activation. Really sorry about those slides. So um, fear and anxiety, and this comes from my work in, in the organization, actually, but fear and anxiety are, uh, I just I added the top one so you didn't think I was an idiot, right? Clearly, you know, it's inevitable and it's useful. But more than that, it kills creativity, it narrows choice, uh, and limits problem solving and adds to the burden of illness. So we really need to be doing things that decrease um, uh, the amount of fear that people uh, experience. So patient activation, I think you've heard a lot about it, so I, I didn't know it was going to be so prominent here. But, you know, there are four levels, and boy, um, you want people at level two or three or four if you can get them there, and you don't want to treat level ones like they're level fours. Human flourishing, I think I just went through, broaden and build. This is Fredrickson's real contribution to the, to the planet, is that uh, positive emotions open our minds, and if you get to a three, they really open your mind, and you start taking action, and you literally see a, a different world, and your kids, your family, and your coworkers, and, and your neighbors will be in a lot better position. Um, these are what I think the leverage points are. Big question mark. Everyone should have a question mark after it, but, but I'm not just being general. I'm saying these places, we need to actually work to, uh, to improve the... Uh, uh, positivity ratio, which is imminently measurable. It takes one minute, okay? It's 20 questions. You can go online to positivity ratio and, and take it yourself. You can read your book. Um, what are the pivotal roles to do this? You know, uh, most of the, conver a lot, half of the conversation maybe today has sort of been pointing back toward healthcare professionals, but others have sort of pointed out maybe that's not the way to go. Maybe it's others. I would say it's, uh, I mean, we don't want to screw it up, but we certainly need to invite these other players uh, into the game, if you ask me. And, and when I talk to 400 CEOs in a meeting, I say, this is free care, guys. You know, th these are the people you need to be helping, uh, help you succeed. Um, community, well, you know, population health, population's a number, right? Community is actually a bunch of relationships, so we really need to get a lot smarter about what communities are, uh, and, and we need to work for our shared health and shared well-being. So many people said in the last day that it is that, that sharing, that sense of helping others, of altruism. So that turns out is, is a huge thing that makes you happier and makes you healthier. It's not just about saving money or getting some part of your copay, you know, removed. That actually kind of pisses you off, even reminding you that you have a copay. Sorry. Um, so connectivity. I'm just trying to say, look. I, I mean, if you knew what I'd done for the last 20 years, a lot of e-connectivity in my past. You know, I'm trying to say it's more than that. It's more than just living in proximity. It's really how do we flourish together and how do we support our communities? Because McKnight is right. If we do that, not withdraw from the game, but move, help the communities come up to the level of service and sort of authority that we have so they have equal authority. Um, I think that's what we need to do is get our positivity ratios up. I think it's imminently doable and probably, I thought on no one's radar until I got here, it's clearly on three or four of the speakers' minds. That, and I'll leave the technology for some other day. Thank you.